I mean spoon. Let's have a little grasp of the derivative function. Now recall that the word derivative is the noun of what we differentiate, or in other words, the gradient. So how will we describe these? Previously, we said that this is a positive and this is a negative graph. Something going up is positive, something going down is negative. But we're going to use the words strictly increasing and strictly decreasing. How do we show something is strictly increasing? It happens when x2 is greater than x1 implies f of x2 is greater than f of x1. What does that mean? It means that if I pick a point here to be x1 and I move across a bit to x2 where x2 is greater than x1 then my y2 is also greater than my y1. I'll say that again so x2 greater than x1 implies f of x2 is greater than x1 means x2 if it's more than x1 then y2 is also more than y1. And strictly decreasing is the opposite. As we go, let's say this is x1, then x2 being greater than x1 implies that y2 is less than y1. Or f of x2 is less than f of x1. So memorize this middle line over there as you'll be using that to describe functions whether they're strictly increasing or strictly decreasing. Now if something is strictly increasing then we can also see that for most of the graph um, that the derivative is greater than zero but it's not always the case. Let me show you when. So here we have two graphs. This one is actually described as strictly increasing even though the gradient is zero at one point. So see how the gradient is always greater than zero but when you're strictly increasing you can have points that are equal to zero, just not intervals. See, there's a whole section there. Let's see why that is the case. If let's say I pick the point zero as my x1, x2 being a tiny little bit to the right of it, as soon as I go a tiny bit to the right of it, my y2 or y of that value would always be a little bit bigger than uh, zero. So I was moved to the right, our y value increases. So that's why we can say that's strictly increasing. But if I have a graph like so, if I pick x1 to be that point there, as we move a little bit to the right, my y is still the same value. It hasn't gone up. y2 is not greater than y1 or f of x2 is not greater than f of x1. So this graph over here, because of the uh, gradient at zero being an interval and not a point, this gradient here, we, sorry, this graph here we describe as just increasing whereas this one is strictly increasing where you can have points where the gradient is zero but not intervals of it. So this graph is not strictly increasing but it is increasing. So increasing you can have intervals, strictly increasing you can only have points because as soon as we go a little bit to the right we must be having a y2, the next y value to be greater than our previous y value. Now be very careful that if the gradient is greater than zero for the whole graph, so the derivative function is greater than zero, then we definitely have a strictly increasing graph. But the reverse is not always true. When is it not true that strictly increasing means the gradient is greater than zero? Well, in situation like this, just because we're strictly increasing doesn't mean the gradient is always greater than zero because as we can see, the gradient is zero at this point. So recap, strictly increasing can have points that the gradient is zero, but definitely not intervals of it. Because with intervals, mean it. what happens is as we move uh, as to the right, so as x1, we go to x2, then our y2 is not greater than our y1. So the statement here fails. So when we have intervals, only increasing, not strictly increasing. Let's have a look at an example. Here we have a uh, cubic. At this point here, x is negative 2, f dash x is 0. At this point here, x is 0 and f dash is also 0. So we can split this graph into three sections, negative infinity to negative 2, negative 2 to 0, 
and 0 to positive infinity. And we can describe each of these sections as increasing, decreasing, or strictly increasing, strictly decreasing. So here we see that the graph is positive. So this one is um, definitely strictly increasing. Here the graph is negative, or in other words, f dash x is less than zero. And here we have a little bit positive to lots positive or positive, and therefore f dash x is greater than zero. So we say this is strictly increasing, this is strictly decreasing, this is strictly increasing. Example two, another cubic. For the graph of f of x over here, determine the intervals in which f of x is strictly increasing. When is our graph strictly increasing? From here to all the way to negative one. Now we're going to split the graph into three sections first, and I'm going to explain this bit, and it's going to sound a little bit tricky. Why do I have a square bracket there, even though the gradient there? Um, is zero because uh, you might think that hang on at that point as I go to the right a little bit we uh, my y value decreases well when we choose intervals the right most the right side of the bracket that is going to be our x2 so we're going to compare the x2 to x1 so x1 is slightly to the left and yes x2 has a y value that's greater than the y value for x1 so let me recap when we're doing strictly increasing and decreasing, we can have square brackets because, for example, for this interval, this is going to be our x2, and we're going to compare it to our x1, which is slightly to the left. And yes, the y2 is going to be greater than y1. And also over here, therefore this is x1, we can have, as at this point here, it is also strictly increasing because as we go to the right a little bit, y2 is also increasing. So 5 to positive infinity. And for strictly decreasing, we have this interval in the middle. And again, square brackets because at that point, x1, as we go to x2, y2 is decreasing. And at that point for x2, remember the right side is x2, then x1 compared to x2, we can see that the y value has also decreased. So that's why it's inclusive over there. Example 3, sketch f dash x, the derivative function of the following. So here we have two graphs. We can see that at the point x is 2, we have a gradient of 0. So then after that, we can see that the gradient is positive. So here we have y values that are positive. And before that, we can see the gradient is negative. So I'm just being a tangent right now. So then it's below the wall um, x-axis. For this gradient, uh, sorry, for this graph, we know the gradient is always going to be the same. So rise over run. So rise is 4, run is 2, 4 over 2 is 2. So the line is always at 2. What about this one? How do we sketch the gradient graph of that one? Well, we can see the points at which the gradient is 0. So that means our gradient function is going to cross the x-axis at 0 because the y value for our gradient is going to be the gradient of this line here. Where else is the gradient is going to be zero over there. So we put two dots there. So we know that at these x values, we have to have a gradient of zero. And then we compare the rest of it. So we can see that the middle section is a negative gradient. So we know it's going to be somewhere down here. And as we get closer to that dot, we're getting less negative. So we're increasing and it does join. And after that point, we are positive. And before that point, we are, sorry, the blue line we're looking at it is also positive, so above, so positive y values. Example three, so let's um, fill in that last graph. So what about this one here, upside down? So again, negative three is where our um, gradient is zero, and also at one, our gradient is zero. But this time, in between it, it's positive, so it's gonna be up, and before it, Sorry, the gradient is negative around there and negative around the other side. So therefore, the y value for the gradient function is down there. What other way can we find the angle of a line? If alpha is the angle of a straight line, sorry, if, angle, if alpha is the angle a straight line makes with the positive direction of the x-axis, then the gradient m of the straight line is equal to tan alpha. So you probably have done this in year 9 or 8 already. 
um, but I'm just going to recap it one more time in terms of the tangent line at that point. So the tangent line, when we look at the angle, we always look at it from the positive x-axis. So not this side, always on the right side there. So again, not this left side, again on that right side there. So that's our angle. So if they wanted to find the other angle, we'll have to do 180 minus that angle. Let's do an example. Oh, and before we not do that, do recall that 1045 is 1. Memorize that if you didn't know that. Example 4. Find the coordinates of the points on the curve with the equation f of x equals 2x squared minus 3x plus 4, at which the tangent line uh, makes an angle 45 with the positive x-axis. We'll worry about the next one in a second. What does it mean by the tangent line makes an angle 45? It means that the gradient is 1 or f dash x is 1. I'm going to circle the word coordinates so that I don't forget to find my y value because that happens sometimes. So we find a gradient of 1 and we're finding the x value first. So if that is the equation then the gradient equation will be 2 times 2 is 4, 2 minus 1 is 1, minus 3. Now the gradient at 1 means 1 equals all of that. Bring the 3 over, we have 4 equals 4x, and then bring the 4 over, we have x equals 1. And because I've circled that, I remember, hang on, I still need to look for the y value. How do I find the y value in the gradient function or the original function? It's in the original function. So we plug x equals 1 into the original function, and we can see that it's going to equal 3. So now we have answered the question. 1, 3 is a coordinate at which the tangent line makes an angle 45 with a positive x-axis. Now, it might sound a bit scary if it's the first time you're doing this, but if you translate angle 45 means gradient equals 1, and then work from that statement, it might look a lot simpler than so many words. Let's see if we can simplify the next part, that the tangent line is perpendicular to the line da di da but when we say perpendicular, straight away we think of the gradient is minus 1 of that gradient or minus 1 over 1 over 7. 1 over 1 over 7 is equal to 7. So the gradient is negative 7. So we have when the gradient is negative 7. So what do we do? We find the gradient, which is up here, for x minus 3. And then we let it equal to negative 7. So now we have... Uh, minus 3 bring cancel on both sides we have minus 4 equals 4x x is equal to negative 1 and again we're looking for the coordinates so we have to plug it in into the original equation and once you plug it in you see that's 9 so the coordinates of the tangent line that is perpendicular to the line y equals 1 over 7 x plus 2 works out to be negative 1 9 example 5 the path of an object is defined by the equation y equals a third x cubed plus two thirds x squared for x is greater than zero, where x is the horizontal distance and y is the vertical distance. Determine the direction of motion when the x value is one. What does the direction mean? It means the angle. So when the x value is one. So let's find the um, derivative first. So x cubed, bring the 3 down, 3 over 3 is 1, 3 minus 1 is 2, so we have x squared. Then bring the 2 down, 2 times 2 is 4 over 3, 2 minus 1 is just 1. So that's the derivative. And we know that derivative at 1 would equal 2, sub 1 in, 7 over 3. So if we have the gradient and we're looking for the angle, how do we figure that out? We would have to go tan inverse to find the angle. So tan inverse of the gradient would give us 66.8 degrees to the x-axis. Example 6. An object follows the path ht equals 10t squared 0 to t 90. So sorry where t is between 0 and 90 um, and h is the height and t is the time in seconds. Find the height and speed of the object where t equals 90. So what does that mean? Speed is a derivative and ht is just the equation height there. A t is 90. So we'll plug 90 where t is to find the height. But for the speed, we have to find a derivative. So let's find a derivative. That's 20t. 
And so at 90, the derivative of this b is equal to 20 times, sub that in, 90, which is 1,800 meters squared. And for the height, just shove in the original equation, the 90, so we obtain 10 times 90 squared is 81,000 meters. If you want to know the, um, the units, a good way to remember it or to work it out, sorry, is, well, if I have H and T, then the gradient is H dash T, or you could write DH DT, DH over DT, where H is meter over T in seconds. So it meters over seconds. After how long will the speed be a thousand meters squared? So what does speed mean? Speed is H dash T, so H dash T equals a thousand meters. That's what we're asking for. See, speed is that. So what you need to be careful with is, is it giving you the X value or the Y value? So if you can interpret that, you've already pretty much done half the work. The, the rest of it is easy, it's just substitution. So now that we know that, let's grab that equation 20T is equal to 1000 divided by 20 means T is equal to 50 seconds. Okay. You might want to rewatch these if I spoke too quickly. Definitely try them, maybe copy the blue writing, then pause the video and see if you can fill in the blue Thank you for watching, I'll see you next time. Bye.